We started last week um, a series of messages on the book of 1 Thessalonians, taking as the title for this series uh, something that Paul says about this church in the first chapter. He calls them a model to all believers, and specifically the way in which they received the gospel is a model to all believers. Uh, This week, you see the, the title there, The Word of God at Work. And the Apostle Paul writing to this church that just a few short years ago that he helped to found and helped to start continues uh, in chapter 2 what he started in chapter 1 which is thanking them and expressing gratitude for this church. Um, True confession, the administration team has wanted to uh, recognize Ms. Kelly's 10 years uh, here at the church since spring. Uh, but we we kept waiting for uh, the right time to have a party and share cupcakes with each other. Uh, And in a pandemic, it's hard to find the right time to have a party and share cupcakes with each other. Uh, So we decided that that November would be a good time, (laughs) since it didn't appear that a good time to have a party and share cupcakes would be approaching anytime soon, that November would be good because it's a time in which we'd start thinking more uh, more than we normally do about gratitude. And so we wanted to start this month of gratitude by expressing gratitude to uh, our longest tenured uh, minister and our our longest tenured um, person who's been a a servant of this church uh, as a member of our staff. And the Apostle Paul talks about that in this chapter 2 and talks about what what effective ministry looks like from the inside and the way in which he feels about the church that he helped to begin, the way in which he feels about this church that he served. Uh, there's just a lot of beautiful things in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and I want to read through it uh, and then circle back and look in a little bit of detail at the things that Paul says to this church. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. You yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. But after we had already suffered and been mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amid much opposition. For our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who examines our hearts. For we never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed, God is witness, nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, even though... As apostles of Christ, we might have asserted our authority. But we prove to be gentle among you, as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. Having so fond an affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become very dear to us. For you recall, brethren, our labor and hardship, how working night and day so as not to be a burden to any of you, we proclaim to you the gospel of God, You are witnesses, and so is God, how devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we behave toward you believers. Just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each one of you as a father would his own children, so that you would walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. For this reason we constantly thank God that when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you also endured the same sufferings at the hands of your own countrymen, even as they did from the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out. They are not pleasing to God, but hostile to all men, hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved, with the result that they always fill up the measure of their sins. But wrath has come upon them to the utmost. But we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short while, in person, not in spirit, were all the more eager and with great desire to see your face. For we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, more than once, and yet Satan hindered us. For who is our hope or joy or crown of exaltation? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming? For you are our glory and our joy." It's a beautiful passage and a beautiful expression of the Apostle Paul's heart for this church. And that's one of the, the best things about Paul's letters, 
Uh, of course, they're a great resource for doctrine, and of course, they're a great resource for teaching. Um, and although, as C.S. Lewis once said, of all the gifts that uh, the, the God gave the Apostle Paul, we wish that God might have given him a little bit more clarity about some of the things that he says. Paul is very clear about the way in which he feels about his churches, the ones that he is happy with and the ones that he is mad at. Uh, and he's very clear about the reason why. And it all comes down to them walking in a manner worthy of the God that calls you into his kingdom and his glory. Go back a little bit to some of the things that Paul says in this chapter. Our coming to you was not in vain, he says in verse 1. We had already suffered and been mistreated in Philippi, as you know. Um, the church at Thessalonica is Paul's rebound church. Uh, <laughs> uh, not, that, uh, not that the church at Philippi didn't go well, and in fact, the church in Philippi is another one of Paul's churches that you can just tell from his letter that he has so much joy when he thinks about them and so much gratitude when he thinks about them. But Paul suffered in Philippi. Uh, as he spread the gospel there in this, in this Macedonian city, um, he, opposition rose up as it, as it often did when Paul spread the gospel and he was put in prison. He and Silas were beaten. That's the famous story of Paul and Silas singing hymns after they had been imprisoned and beaten and in chains. Uh, God miraculously freed them through an earthquake. And Paul uh, pulled out his driver's license for the first time at his trial and said, I'm a Roman citizen. Uh, and then everybody was uh, embarrassed because you're not supposed to do that sort of thing to Roman citizens. And so Paul was politely asked to leave town. And so when Paul says that he suffered and been mistreated at Philippi, that's what he means. And one of the things that blessed him so much about the church of the Thessalonians was that they the way in which they received a person who had just recently been kicked out of town uh, they could have very easily looked at him with suspicion. They could have very easily looked at him with cynicism. They could have very easily uh, kept their distance from him and said, uh, I don't know if we want any part of what you're selling if it brings trouble on us. But Paul says, you saw that we had the boldness to speak to you the gospel of God even amidst much opposition. And opposition rose up and the church didn't reject Paul and didn't reject the gospel. They didn't reject the gospel of Jesus Christ because of the opposition that rose up there in Thessalonica. Paul gives his resume here that they already knew. He says the reason why they received him was because of what he was not. In verse 3, our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit. Um, I have a book in my office that I, I really enjoy. It's written by an, an English professor. And I refer to it from time to time. Um, the name of the book is Caring for Words in a Culture of Lies. Uh, and one of the true things, but it is stated this way, it still comes off as a little bit shocking, is that uh, the generation that is coming up, uh, the generation maybe from uh, my generation and down, um, we, are, we sort of come prepackaged with the expectation that people are going to lie to us. Uh, you occasionally see people of a certain age saying, I miss Walter Cronkite. Who here misses Walter Cronkite? Okay, I see, I, thank you, I see that hand. Um, there, in previous generations, was this expectation that people on the news, for example, would tell you the truth. Uh, and depending on where you go and depending on who you ask, there seems to be a, a lack of that expectation. Uh, people don't, don't expect that those who are bringing information to them are bringing them true information. Um, that's not new in human history, by the way. The culture in which Paul was preaching the gospel was a cynical culture. Uh, they, they were not, uh, you know, happy-go-lucky optimists <laughs> everywhere that Paul went. There was this expectation, and the reason Paul says this is because that they very easily could have heard Paul this way. They could have heard him as a person who was in error. They might not have doubted his sincerity, but they could have said, well, he's sincerely wrong. Uh, they could have just said, you've made a, a great mistake, Paul, in believing that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. They could have doubted his purity. They could have said, you are, seem to be the type of person who's clearly out to make a buck. Uh, and there were people in the ancient world who did this, traveling philosophers. There were people that uh, were philosophers because they really loved philosophy, and there were people who were philosophers because they could pay, have people pay them to teach them philosophy. And it didn't really matter so much the philosophy that they taught as much as who they could get to pay them. And Paul says, you could tell that that wasn't us. We were not doing this for financial gain. We were not doing this to trick you or deceive you. Ultimately, it wasn't about us. It was about, he says, the fact that we had been approved by God, given this gospel, validated, you might say, by God, to be entrusted with the gospel. God had given us something precious. 
that we then gave to you freely. Uh, not, out of, not, not a mistake, uh, not deceit, and not impure, but given by God and then given by God, given from us to you. Not, not trying to please men, but trying to please God who examines our hearts. And I love that in the background of uh, this passage is, is Paul talking about his motivation. God examines their hearts, but God, he says, examines our hearts. Uh, everything that Paul does, he is doing with God as a witness. Uh, Paul doesn't have to say, with God as my witness, to prove that he's telling the truth, because he always is living with the expectation that God is the witness of what he is doing. God is the witness of the way in which he bring the, brings the gospel to people. He, he continues with what they didn't do. We never came, in verse 5, with flattering speech, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. And again, God is witness. <laughs> uh, still, God continues to be witness. Nor did we seek glory from men, not you, not from other people. And Paul does this from time to time. He does this most in the, the little letter to Philemon. Even though, as apostles of Christ, we might have asserted our authority. We could have just told you, this is how it is. And this is how you need to be. But Paul approaches these people and Paul approaches the gospel slightly differently. Even when Paul really clearly has something that he wants someone to do, as in the book of Philemon, uh, a story of a slave who had run away and Paul writes to the slave's owner to say, I want you to accept this person back, not punish them, also, set them free. Uh, and Paul says, very similar here, as an apostle, I could tell you to do that. I have the authority given by God to tell you what to do, but I'm not going to do that. Paul in Philemon says, for love's sake, I'm asking you, as one brother in Christ to another, to do this for your brother in Christ. And here Paul says, as uh, apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority, but instead, he says, we prove to be gentle among you as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. Later in this chapter, he says, as a father uh, would to his own children, we exhorted you and encouraged you and implored you. These can be tricky metaphors. Um, not everyone has great relationships with their mother or their father. But uh, if you have, then you can attach to this metaphor very easily. If you don't have a great relationship with your mother or father or both, then you have to sort of... Uh, uh, look to other examples that you have seen of, of godly motherhood, of godly fatherhood. When you think about the Apostle Paul, um, the Apostle Paul as being gentle probably was not the first thing that you would think of. If I asked you to go around the room and, and give me an adjective for the Apostle Paul, uh, you might say what he says about himself in verse 1 or, or 2, bold. Uh, Paul was certainly bold. Um, Paul was... Uh, uh, what did, the, what did the, the Corinthians say about him? He's very, he's very forceful in his speech, uh, but his letters aren't that great. <laughs> I love that Paul included his own criticism sometimes. There were a lot of, of adjectives that we might use, but Paul describes himself with this church as like a gentle nursing mother, with this church as like a father who's trying to teach and exhort and put you on the path. This, I think, is really important for us, especially in our culture and also in Paul's culture. Uh, being gentle in Paul's culture was not something that was highly prized. <laughs> uh, gentility and being, uh, being approachable, being meek, uh, was not something that, that uh, people in authority, it was not a quality that they were admired for having. And so you can tell, because Paul is proud of his, legitimately and rightfully proud of his relationship with these people, you can tell that Paul is operating on a different level than the culture around him. He's not bought into the things that the culture around him says are important. He's looking elsewhere for an example. Uh, and that example, of course, is Jesus Christ. Uh, when you, if, we, if I asked you for adjectives about Jesus Christ and Jesus' Jesus's relationship with people, gentle is one of the things that you might say, uh, especially with children, especially with those that are outcasts, especially with those that other people would push away. And so Paul imitates Christ by being gentle uh, among them. A couple of weeks ago, you all gave me a, a card that meant a lot to me uh, as pastor, and you, you did that for me. You, you wrote down some adjectives that, that uh, you thought of when uh, you thought of me, and one of the ones that was in there was gentle, uh, and that, that means more to me than I can say, uh, because that's the kind of minister that I want to be, uh, is, is one that you can count on to be compassionate, uh, one that you can count on to have a heart. <laughs> one that you can count on to be understanding in their relationship to people. But more than that, because that's a Christ-like quality. 
We need to be very careful if we hold up leaders or if we hold up leadership, especially in the church. We need to be careful if we hold up qualities of leadership that are not Christ-like qualities. Um, if, we are, if we do that, then we need to be reminded that you cannot serve two masters. If you are looking to follow Christ, then you need to look for Christ-like qualities in leaders and in leadership. That's something that we find here with the Apostle Paul. Having so fond an affection for you, he says in verse 8, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become very dear to us. That's a good description of ministry. And I say that not to make a separation between um, ministers and, and lay people. Uh, Paul never really makes that distinction. Um, what he's talking about is when you serve, when you use the gifts that God has given you, you're not just checking off a box. I, I have done this thing that God told me to do. If you are using the gifts that God has given you to build up the church, you're doing what we read earlier from Romans 12. You're offering yourself as a living sacrifice. Um, the New Testament does not have this concept of one part of our life being, being separated for ourselves and the other part of our lives being given to God. Um, it's, it's all or nothing <laughs> from the New Testament perspective. Take up your cross and follow me, Jesus said, means every part of you. And so when we offer our gifts in service to God, we're offering ourself to those that we serve. This is uh, risky, <laughs> uh, as you might imagine. Again, going back to the, the letter of Philemon, Paul talks about, I'm giving you my very heart. Uh, and when you put your heart out there sometimes, your heart gets stomped on. When you give yourself uh, to other people sometimes, that can really hurt <laughs> when uh, you're not treated the way that, that you wish you, you would have been. But there's really no other way to do this. Uh, there's really no other way to be the church other than to give ourselves to one another, other than to approach, our, approach one another in this way other than to say, I'm putting myself in your hands uh, and asking you to love me like you love yourself. That's what the church is supposed to do. And there's no other sincere way to do that as a, as a body of believers other than to give our lives to one another in the name of Jesus Christ. Paul says, you recall that we worked hard not to be a burden to any of you. Uh, you were witnesses along with God, verse 10, of how devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we behave toward you, so that all of this, all of this for the purpose, in verse 12, that you would walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Two things going on here. One is Paul's favorite metaphor for the Christian life is walking. Um, and I love that metaphor for a couple of reasons. Um, walking is for most of us, is easy under normal circumstances. Uh, there are some abnormal circumstances, though. If you're a baby, walking is hard. <laughs> it takes practice. It takes some falling down. If you're injured, walking is hard. It takes uh, some, some equipment. It takes some support. It takes some encouragement from other people. But most of the time, for most of us, walking is something that we do without thinking about it a whole lot. It is something we have to think about. It's not like breathing, where your body's going to do it uh, whether you think about it or not. But you, you have to expend some effort into it. But when you're used to it, you can just go. And that really is a great example of the Christian life. When you start off in the Christian life, it's really like a baby learning to walk. You have to re-examine everything and say, is this something that Christ would have me do? We have to relearn to walk when we're injured, uh, either because we have uh, sinned and need to repent, uh, or because we are, have encountered some real trouble in our life and it's really shaken us up, we might have to, to relearn, how do I walk with God in these circumstances? What does it mean to be a Christian uh, if this horrible thing has happened to me? If I have uh, an illness I wasn't expecting, if, I, if something has happened in my family that I wasn't expecting, if something has happened in the world that I wasn't expecting, that can be like an injury. But the call is still to walk in a manner worthy of the calling that we've received. The good news is that we don't have to do that by ourselves. Uh, Paul, in verse 12 there, where he says that you would walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you, those yous are y'alls. Uh, those are plural yous. We want you as a church to walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you. Not just as individuals, but as a church. I want you to put one... And the other thing I love about that metaphor is walking is putting one foot in front of the other. It requires some balance. 
It requires knowing how to live with the Word of God in the world. But really, it's putting one foot in front of the other. It's taking the next step. It's doing the next thing that you know that God wants you to do. Uh, all of us, when we want to know the will of God, uh, it's usually something big. But I think God wants us to learn to follow his will in the small things uh, before he reveals big things to us. We'll talk about that in a couple of weeks when we talk about God's will for us. But God's will for us is that we would walk one step, uh, one step at a time. One, the, next, the next good thing that God wants you to do, do that. And walk in a manner worthy of the God that calls you into his own kingdom. We mentioned last week that uh, in Philippi, there was a riot. When Paul preached the gospel in Thessalonica, there was a riot. And it's because of something that's sort of lying right there, but we, we don't really notice it as we read scripture. The God who calls you into his kingdom. Paul is talking to people who already belong to a kingdom. Uh, Paul was talking to people who already had a Lord, and that was Caesar. And that was the thing that Paul had been accused of, was teaching people not to worship Caesar, or not to follow Caesar, but to follow some other king instead. And I told you last week that Paul would have said, yeah, <laughs> sort of. Uh, in the sense of proclaiming that Caesar is not Lord, but Jesus is, then yes, absolutely. I'm telling people to follow a different kingdom. Uh, Paul was not creating revolutionaries. What he was creating was uh, a, new, a new nation, uh, spread out in every nation. The kingdom of God. A kingdom that transcends any worldly boundary. Uh, God doesn't have a favorite country. God's favorite country is the kingdom of God. Uh, God's favorite people are the people that follow him and give their lives to him. And that uh, is all over the world. Paul says, that's what I'm about. And that's what I've always been about and always will be about, is teaching you to walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you. How do we do that? We do that by the word of God. Verse 13 we constantly thank God. Paul is still on the thank you portion of his letter. We constantly thank God that when you received the word of God that you heard from us, you didn't accept it as the word of men, but what it really is, the word of God, which performs its work in you who believe. Um, we as Baptists uh, have a, a tradition that we talk about, when we talk about the word of God, we make a, a differentiation. This is the written word of God. And Jesus Christ is the living Word of God. Uh, Jesus Christ is the living Word of God, the Word with a capital W. So when we want to know what God wants us to do, we look to Jesus Christ. Uh, now, of course, the way that we know what Jesus wants us to do is by looking at the written Word of God. But it's not just that we are people of the book. We also are people of the Spirit. We believe that Jesus Christ is not contained here. Uh, this is not just a record of Jesus' teaching and examples. Jesus is present with us, present with us as a body of believers. And so we believe that the word of God, Paul, when Paul says that, he's not saying something that is, is contained. Uh, for him, it would be in a scroll. For us, a leather-bound volume. He's talking about something that's active, uh, that's present, as a, an ongoing power in our lives. So well, the word of God is not just the written word of God, but the living, active Word of God, God speaking to His people, uh, God speaking to His people through modern-day prophets, God speaking to His people through the Holy Spirit primarily, God speaking to His people through the present activity of Jesus Christ in the world, as well as through written Scripture. Uh, that's what we want from you. Uh, that's what we rejoice with you, is that the Word of God performs its work in you who believe. We talked about that last week. Uh, Paul says the gospel did what it's supposed to do. When the Word of God is preached, it does work. Uh, there's power when the Word of God is preached. There's, there's power when the Gospel is preached. It does things in people's lives. It makes a real change uh, of people turning from sin and turning from a path of destruction in their life to a path of fulfilling the purpose that God created them for. Turning from sin, turning from judgment, and turning towards salvation. The Word of God works, and it performs that work in people's lives. It saves them and teaches them then how to walk in salvation. But it comes with a warning. Uh, your Bible may not come with a warning on it, uh, but it, it probably should. Uh, this is the warning. If you accept the word of God, you need to expect opposition. Verse 14, you became imitators of the churches of God in Jesus Christ that are in Judea. For you endured the same sufferings at the hands of your own countrymen, even as they did from the Jews. I want to point something out to you. This is one of the more, interest, more uh, uh, unusual things I learned in seminary. Uh, if, you, if you have a copy of the Bible in front of you, uh, in verse, between verse 14 and 15, is there a comma? Uh, 
Okay. So a little, uh, a little scriptural uh, background. Th there were not commas in, uh, <laughs> in uh, the, the manuscripts of, of scripture that we have. Uh, the oldest Greek copies uh, that we have of, of scripture don't have punctuation at all. Uh, so it is biblical translators that put uh, punctuation into the Bible. Quotation marks, exclamation points, things like that. And it depends on context, what they're saying. Um, some biblical scholars call that comma between verse 14 and 15 the anti-Semitic comma. Uh, anti-Semitism anti means that you are against Jewish people. And if you're not careful, this verse 14 and 15 sounds like Paul is against Jewish people. Let, I'm going to really emphasize the comma. Are you ready? Um, verse 14 you endured the same sufferings at the hands of your own countrymen, even as they did from the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out. So it sounds like Paul is blaming Jews for all of those things. This is really important because, unfortunately, Christian history has really embraced that idea uh, for a lot of centuries, less so now, although it's still out there. Uh, now, now I'm going to read it again and take the comma away. Uh, the same sufferings at the hands of your own countrymen, even as they did from the Jews who both killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out. You see the difference? It's not just the Jews. It's the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets. It's a, it's a, a subcategory of Jewish people. Those who, are, uh, those who thought it was a good idea to kill Jesus. Uh, those who thought it was a good idea to kill the prophets. So Paul is not against Jewish people. Paul is a Jewish person. <laughs> Everywhere Paul went to preach the gospel, he went first to the synagogue. Paul is not blaming Jewish people for the death of Jesus. He is saying that those Jewish people who put Jesus to death and did not then repent, those Jewish people who put the prophets to death and did not then repent, they can expect the judgment of God because they did not accept what God was doing in the world. That's what's going on there. So I didn't want you to uh, come away from this thinking Paul sounds a little anti-Semitic because he was not. Um, that part goes through verse 16, and then he summarizes what he wants to say here in verse 17. We, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short while, in person, not in spirit, we're still with you, in other words, in spirit, we're all the more eager with great desire to see your face. We wanted to come to you, me, Paul, not just Silas and Timothy, not just us generally, but me personally. I wanted to come to you, but Satan hindered me, or hindered us. Because who is our hope, our joy, our crown of exaltation? It's you. In the presence of our Lord Jesus that is coming. For you are our glory and our joy. I asked you last week to, to sort of imagine if First Thessalonians or a scrap of First Thessalonians was the only thing that we knew about the New Testament. If the New Testament was like most ancient documents and all we had was scraps of it, uh, what would we know? What we would know from chapter 2 is how much this minister loved the people that he preached the gospel to. What we would know is how powerful he believed the word of God is. What we would know is that suffering can be expected, opposition can be expected by those who embrace the gospel because it puts them at odds with a culture that worships and glorifies other things, uh, a culture that sits opposed to the purposes of God, but also that there are spiritual forces that are opposed to God. Verse 18, Satan hindered us. Paul doesn't talk about Satan a lot, but there it is. Uh, a power, a spiritual power that's opposed to God, that prevented Paul from doing that something that Paul wanted to do for the sake of the gospel. And yet, I don't know if you noticed this as we sang how firm a foundation. We talked about God transforming those things that, uh, that, that grieve us. God transforming those things that hurt us and making them sanctify us and make them holy. Do you know what we have because Satan hindered Paul from going back to visiting the Thessalonican church? First Thessalonians. <laughs> Because Paul couldn't go in person, he wrote this letter. Paul, when he was called as an apostle, didn't say, I think I'm going to write the New Testament. Uh, he was just writing letters, spirit-inspired letters, to churches that he wished he could have been with in person. But because he did, we know about the church. We know about the power of the gospel and what it did in their lives. God transforms things that the Satan intends to hinder and makes them uh, multiply out and have effects beyond what we would originally intend. Verse 19, who is our hope, our joy, our crown of exaltation? It's you in the presence of our Lord Jesus that is coming. When Jesus Christ returns, and there's his return again. It was already in chapter 1. Here it is in chapter 2. When Christ returns again, what is Jesus going to high-five Paul about? It's you. 
It's the Thessalonian church. When Jesus returns, what are, are Jesus and I going to uh, party about? It's, it's you. This is beautiful, but it's also challenging. Um, preview, coming uh, up in a couple of weeks is our uh, mission service. We normally will have a mission banquet, um, circumstances being what they are, pandemically speaking. Uh, we, we won't do a banquet this year, but we will do a mission service. We want to continue, uh, and, con and especially continue, during this time to serve, uh, to, to give our resources so that other people can hear the gospel. Whether we will do an actual trip sort of depends on, on what happens uh, in the state of our, our pandemic. But when it comes to our mission trip that we normally take to the valley, one of the things that I love about that mission trip is that I get to experience something that I as a pastor don't always get to experience, which is to start a project at the beginning of the day and finish a project at the end of the day and say, that's done. That's hard to do as a pastor. Uh, who is our hope or our joy or our crown of exaltation? It's you. But as a pastor, there's not really a point in which I can say, my work here at the church is done. Uh, you have all been exhorted and encouraged enough. Uh, the Word of God has done its work in you. So, I don't know, I guess I'll go sell tennis shoes or something. Uh, you don't really get to do that. Because the work is you, the work is ongoing. Because God's work in you is ongoing. Because the kingdom of God continues. Because there are more people who need to hear the gospel. Because, they're, uh, because we are giving our lives to one another then there's not really a place in which you can cut that off and say, I think I've given enough of my life to you. <laughs> I think I've had enough of you. Uh, I think we're done here. Uh, that's, that's not a thing uh, in, in the church. So it's a challenge, but it's also a blessing. Because uh, if I'm on the mission trip, and I paint, we start painting a house, and we get done painting the house at the end of the day, that, that's a nice feeling to be able to say, yeah, it was good, it was done, check. Check that off. Uh, but I think it's God's grace that you don't get to do that in church because uh, it, it, the, the promise is for the future. When Christ returns, what will be my hope and my joy and my crown of exaltation? In this life, in my life, in your life, there's not a point in which I can say, our work here is done. <laughs> We've done everything that we can do. But there will be a point, and that point is the return of Christ in which God says, the work is done. It's finished. Uh, and there will be rejoicing. There will be glory. There will be joy. There will be reward for those who have given their lives to the service of the church. And I'm not talking about pastors. I'm talking about pe people in the church who are using the gifts that God has given them to build up the church. We'll be able to say when Jesus Christ returns and the church worships together. We'll be able to say when every tribe and tongue and nation and people worships around the throne, check. <laughs> Good job. Uh, and, and pray, the praise and the glory will go to God. Uh, the joy will be ours to rejoice and worship and, and be able to say, to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. That's what we want to hear. I pray for you today that you would look at your life as part of the church and really understand it in this way. We were pleased to give you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives. Uh, we're not just checking off a thing that we have to do, not just uh, taking care of, of the important spiritual business of our lives, but giving our lives to one another, to encourage one another, to exhort one another, to help each other walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls us. Our joy and our exaltation, our hope, our crown, for doing that work comes when Jesus Christ returns. But there's blessings in the meantime, too. There's blessings of seeing uh, children grow up. There's blessings of seeing uh, people understand their gifts and use their gifts in a new way. There's blessings of seeing people embrace uh, service and learn to love to serve. There are blessings in the meantime as well. But I want you to, as Paul says here, fix our hope on Jesus Christ that is coming and be able to, to look at this work, the work that God is doing in not only this church but in all churches and say, good job. <laughs> good job, God. Good job, Holy Spirit. Good job, all who gave their lives to participate in the work that God is doing in the church and in the world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessing of the church.
thank you, God, for this group of people and the blessing of them sharing their lives with me and the blessing of being able to share my life with them. We thank you for the blessing of your word, God, that teaches us by the example and, and the words of Jesus Christ. And we thank you, God, for the power of the Holy Spirit that connects us to Jesus Christ so that he can instruct us, guide us, encourage us. We pray, God, that your word would be at work in us to teach us how to walk. Lord, in the day-to-day -day life, taking just our daily steps, uh, God, if we're going through difficult times, I pray, Lord God, that you would help us to encourage one another uh, by the word of God to teach one another and, and uh, God, just empower one another to be able to walk in a manner worthy of the calling that you've given us. I pray, God, for this church that you would help us to speak the gospel and live the gospel boldly. Help us to be an example uh, to all believers, God, and especially to those who don't know you, of what a gentle and loving and uh, spirit-filled church looks like. And I pray, God, that your word and your power would continue to transform us in that way. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.